Good evening. And uh, welcome to Science for All Seasons. My name is Lisa Gerard. I'm the Director of Scientific Communications here at the Broad. And I'm happy to be here at our Spring Science for All Seasons, which is an extension of our summer, Midsummer Nights Science program. Uh, how many people have attended some of these before? OK, great. So um, for any of those remaining who haven't, uh, this is a lecture series for the community that explores a number of different topics in genomics and medicine. And for those of you who know people who weren't able to make it tonight, we are recording this and it will be available shortly on our website and the Broad YouTube channel. Um, so I'm really excited about tonight's topic and tonight's speaker. Tonight we have Heidi Rem, and she's going to be talking to us about the medical interpretation of human, gen of human genomes. So Heidi wears a number of hats within the Broad community. So she's an institute member at the Broad Institute. She's also the chief laboratory director of the Laboratory for Molecular Medicine at Partners Healthcare, um, as well as associate professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School. And she also has additional appointments at the Brigham, Boston Children's, as well as MGH. So as we start to identify changes in our DNA sequence that have implications for disease, we have to really think carefully about how these changes are going to be used in diagnosis, um, as well as how to share important genomic data. So Heidi's research is focused on defining standards for the use of next generation sequencing in clinical diagnostics, and how to interpret DNA sequence variation, as well as promoting data sharing. So Heidi received her undergraduate degree in molecular biology and biochemistry from Middlebury College, and then she went on to do doctoral work in genetics, as well as postdoctoral work, both at the Harvard Medical School, and then completed a fellowship in clinical molecular genetics, also at Harvard Medical School. So please join me in welcoming Heidi to the Broad Science for All Seasons tonight. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you some of the work that, that we've been doing in, uh, in genetics and genomics. I, the central theme that I'm going to talk about today is the medical interpretation of human genomes, although I'll, talk, I'll touch on a few different things. Um, I tried to leave time uh, in the second half of my talk to really get into some case examples that I've encountered in my career. Um, and just to add a little bit to what Lisa shared, so for the last really about 14 years, I've been directing a molecular diagnostic lab. So most of my experience comes from testing patients early on doing Sanger sequencing and then next-gen sequencing and now whole exome and genome sequencing. So it's, I, I've evolved with genomics over the last 14 years in my current um, role. Uh, and then just in the last year or two, joined um, as the medical director of the Broad's CLIA lab and now um, being part of the clinical testing that happens here, which has been very exciting as well. Um, my, my, uh, I, I went to my 20, 20th high school reunion a number of years ago and uh, what I saw on, the, um, on a list was what we thought our careers would be when we grew up. <laughs> and I had written genetic engineer. I thought that was pretty close. <laughs> so, so there's clearly, I've, I've had an interest in the space for a long time. Um, but, uh, but now I can do lots more fun stuff with, it, with uh, what we're doing today. So I, so, and, and I should say, feel free to raise your hand during this and ask a question at any point. I really want this to be interactive, and that's one of the reasons I put a bunch of cases in and some questions along the way. Um, we don't have to get through all the slides, so feel free to shout out. So to, oops, this doesn't work. Hmm. You know, oh, you know what? I don't, it's, a, it's advancing this, but it's not doing anything here. That's it. Ah, there we go. Um, so I, one of the things I wanted to sort of sh go over is wh what are the ways and the uses of genetic and geno genomic testing that we encounter today? Um, so one of the areas that some of you may be familiar with is, is direct-to-consumer testing. Um, things like discovering your ancestry or complex trait risk analysis. Do I have risk for heart disease or diabetes or cancer? 
things like the 23andMe panel, doing paternity or other types of identity testing. Is dad really my dad or not? Um, and other even more sketchy stuff. So, you know, the 23andMe kit for $199, you can get all your risk assessment. How many of you have actually done 23andMe? Excellent. And if it didn't cost any money, how many of you would do 23andMe? <laughs> A lot of you. Okay. So the price has been coming down. It's now only 199 bucks. Ask for it for Christmas next year. Um, so we went over that. Um, and as I mentioned, you can get your ancestry done. And there's a whole like social network you know, for people who get their ancestry assessment by genetics and then can find their relatives in, around the world. Um, uh, here's Gen Trace. I just copied things off the internet. I have no investment in any of these companies. Um, this is you know, $79 for a complete DNA paternity test. Um, it gets more sketchy as we go on. This is the DNA test slim or premium, and it's all about what you should eat and developing menu plans for you based on your genetics. I can tell you there's not a, a lot of scientific grounding in this particular <laughs> testing area, but if you want to spend your money, this is in pounds. Here's the prices. Go at it. My, I couldn't resist this picture. <laughs> it's like DNA fit, you know. So uh, upgrade your training knowledge with a simple DNA fit test. So clearly, the uh, commercial industry is is uh, taking advantage of genetics and genomics. Uh, the last one here, the, my favorite down here, my child's DNA insights kit. <laughs> so you can pretty much order about anything on the internet. Um, but, so, feeling disillusioned by the commercial genomics market? Yes, I am. Have no fear, the government is here. So, I should mention that there is some oversight of genetic and genomic testing by the government. It actually comes in three flavors. Um, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, actually oversees clinical laboratories. Um, the FDA oversees the production of testing kits, um, and the FDA FTC oversees you know, false and misleading advertising, which you might see in some things that could fall into that category. Um, there's actually been a fair bit of public and, and, profession and debate in our community about the FDA wanting to get very directly involved in the oversight of genetic testing, partly related to things I just showed you on the slides. So, and there's you know, a lot of debate about that. There's clearly some areas of genetic and genomic testing that really could be better regulated, but other areas that having to apply and spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars getting FDA proof of your test could really inhibit the, the uh, advancement, rapid advancement that's happening in our field that is benefiting patients in many ways. So there's a lot of debate over this. The, 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 the story isn't over yet. So now if we turn to, to less about direct to consumer, but really how do we use genetic and genomic testing in the medical arena today. And I listed out a number of the you know, examples that, that I encounter. So diagnostic testing for rare disease is typically done with gene panels, a set of genes that you're testing, or exome. And we'll talk a little bit about those different things. Tumor genetic analysis, you develop cancer and you get a biopsy of your tumor, want to understand the genetics um, about that tumor that might tell you what drug to treat it with and what your prognosis is. Um, carrier screening for reproductive risk, am I going to have a child with a, a genetic disorder? Lots of, of people get that. Some Ashkenazi <laughs> Jewish specific panels, other that are just comprehensive for all rare recessive disorders. You might get prenatal testing using certain um, karyotype or cytogenomic microarrays often. Infectious disease typing, what's the organism that's making me ill? Um, HLA markers for organ transplantation or blood transfusions. These are all ways that we use genetics and genomics in the routine clinical practice. We also, of course, use it in research studies, whether it's discovering genes or biomarkers for different diseases or um, genetic testing to define a patient so you can try out new therapies that might be beneficial, um, or implementation science. We have two programs really introducing genomics into the practice of medicine called the MedSeq and BabySeq studies. So lots of ways that we're using genomics in research as well. Um, so I mentioned a few words, exome, genome. Probably a lot of you know what these mean. Some of you may not. Um, if we look at what we actually can interpret and understand of the DNA in our bodies today. So this is our whole genome for, from a relative perspective, three billion base pairs. But the part that we mostly can 
attempt to interpret is really the, the genes within the genome. And that only makes up a small percentage, this light blue area, the exome. That's all of the coding sequences that actually are the genes that make the proteins that actually do all the stuff in our bodies to make us work. So um, that's still a relatively small proportion of the entire genome. The clinical exome we sometimes call the part of the, the, num the genes that we actually understand today in some way, shape, or form, or associated with diseases, and that's only, you know, a subset of those. If we run a, a gene panel test, you know, maybe you have a specific diagnosis. I have hearing loss. I want to get a test for the genes that are known to be involved in hearing loss. That's a small subset, maybe 100 genes. I have cardiomyopathy. You know, I want to test just those genes. That's maybe 60 genes. So each of these panels are a subset of genes. And then a very small proportion of that is all these sort of um, more biomarker type, pharmacogenomics, complex, complex traits like are done in the 23andMe test, ancestry markers. These are just a very small portion of it, genotypes scattered throughout the genome. So this is kind of gives you a sense of the relative perspective. Now, we started here with the little dots. As sequencing costs have dropped precipitously over the last, you know, 10 years, it's allowed us to rapidly expand the content that we can actually sequence in a single test. And now we are at the point of really spending just a few thousand dollars for a clinical, you know, whole genome test. And so it's, it allows us to do all of it. The challenge is that most of that we don't understand. So when you sequence an entire genome, you may get the full three billion bases. There's still only a very small portion of that that we can actually interpret. And we'll talk more about the interpretation. So genome, full genome sequencing is not commonly used in any clinical practice. Uh, it is used here and there, and it's starting to become more and more common. And I anticipate within the next couple of years, genome sequencing will probably replace exome sequencing. But, but right now, today, the largest uses are in more larger genome project, biobank projects um, that are happening all over the US and around the world. Um, the Human Genome Project started mostly with one genome. Then the thousand genomes, there's the personal genome project that the church lab um, here has, has um, done a number of genomes, the Illumina sponsored Understand Your Genome events that have been going on for the last few years, Genomics England doing 100,000 patients in England, and now the Precision Medicine Initiative is just launching, which will sequence a million patients. So lots of energy directed at genome analysis going forward, but still not quite routinely used in clinical care. So, following on from the last question I asked you, how many of you have had your exome or genome sequenced, if you're willing to share? So maybe about five or 10 of you, five or so. If you have not, but it was free, how many would you have your exome or genome sequenced? Uh, similar response, so most of you. So we're all intrigued by our genome. So what, what can we actually learn from a genome if we had it sequenced? So the way I look at it, you know, if you get your genome sequenced, on average, there's about three to five million variants. That means from some reference that we just say is the reference genome, how many differences the average person here have against that reference? And on average, that's three to five million changes. That's a lot of work to look at. So when we think about a genome, one thing we can do is what I call an indication report. You have some clinical problem or some question, and you want to try and find an answer for it in your genome. So you order a test. Maybe it's a, a disease of some sort. I have cardiomyopathy, I have hearing loss, I have retinal disease, I have whatever. Can you look in those genes and figure out why I have it? Um, maybe you develop another disease, now you ask another question or another one. So you can do as many sort of queries of your genome for specific indications. Um, or, you know, in some of the studies we do, we do what we sort of call general genome analysis. Tell me anything in my genome that could impact my health. And so what can we tell you? Well, Sometimes we can look through those three to five million variants and look for specific known variants, things that people have already established as associated with some disease or condition or trait. That could be what I call monogenic diseases, um, diseases that are due to a mutation in one gene, sort of fairly direct relationship. That could be a recessive disease where it takes two bad copies, one from mom and one from dad, to get the disease. So you could be a carrier for it and only have one bad copy or you could be affected and have both bad copies. Or it could be a dominant disease like hereditary breast cancer 
You only need one copy to get that. Um, so we can find known variants for monogenic diseases. If you had a tumor, we could sequence your tumor and look for um, ge genetic variants that have been associated with diagnostic or prognostic or treatment responses. Um, we can look at common variants. This is like the 23andMe sort of thing, where these are hundreds of, of genotypes that have been associated through statistical correlation with heightened or reduced risk of certain diseases. Now, almost all of these are what we call very low effect. It's like, oh, you have a 1.2-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Great. That's not high enough for me to actually do anything about it. <laughs> Some people are like, okay, I'll start running more, or, you know, eating, eating healthier food, but they're low effect, so they don't really, in a strong way, predict your outcome. Um, pharmacogenomic markers. So, you know, I have a variant, and if I take this particular drug, I'm going to have a serious adverse event. Or my metabolism of this drug is lower or higher than other people. I need to take more of it or, low, or less of it. Um, so we have these pharmacogenomic markers. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can look at lots of markers and determine your ancestry. Where did I come from? Now, the other challenge that, in fact, most of these variants fall into is the novel or rare variants that we don't really understand well. And so particularly when we're doing sort of indication-based reports where we're saying, focus in on a set of genes and look in there and see if you can find anything in that gene that might relate to my disease that I'm concerned about. When we have that very specific question, then we dive into the novel and the rare stuff and we start looking um, for things that might cause disease. And then we classify along a sort of um, scale of do we think it's pathogenic or that it would cause disease? We think it's benign and has no relation to disease. Or the dreaded VUS, we are uncertain. Um, and that may be for monogenic diseases or you get your tumor sequence and you look at certain genes that are known to be involved in disease, but you find a variant. Is it gonna be clinically impactful, suggest a treatment or not, or no, we don't understand it. So these are the kinds of things we spend a lot of time on when we have specific questions we're trying to ask. Um, so I'm gonna focus a little more on the sort of rare genetic diseases spectrum, which I would think, which I tend to call, as you saw on the other slides, monogenic disease. They're actually not rare, particularly in collect collection. There's 30 million people in the US with a rare genetic disease or a monogenic disease. That's one in 10. There are people in this audience, I'm sure, that have some sort of monogenic disease. Um, so you often think about these as really severe things that, that kill children, but there's lots of diseases of all sorts of types. This is Bella Dunning. She is deaf and visually impaired due to Usher syndrome. She's actually the first patient I diagnosed with Usher syndrome over 10 years ago um, through our testing. Cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death under age 35. You hear about this most when you hear about the athlete that died because they make the news. You know, it doesn't only kill athletes, it kills normal people too, but these guys make the news. So this is Reggie Lewis, he died of cardiomyopathy. Hank Gathers, you know, there's lots of famous athletes that have died due to cardiomyopathy. These are all monogenic diseases where there's a very high effect. You have a variant and the chance you will develop disease can be very high. It can be ranged from 100% down to something lower, but usually fairly certain. Angelina Jolie, her family had a breast cancer mutation. She has a pretty high chance of developing breast cancer. That's why she had her breasts removed. Now, one of the challenges we deal with in rare disease or monogenic disease space is that there's no standards or a resource to define the validity of a gene disease relationship. Is this a breast cancer gene or not? I don't know, it's been reported as one, but do I believe the evidence? And here's an example of the evidence that this is a challenge. This is the number of genes included in cardiomyopathy tests from 14 different US clinical labs. You ask, why are they all different? Don't we know the set of genes that cause this disease? Shouldn't all these tests be the same? Well, no, we have different opinions. I, I included that one, I thought it looked good, but, but I didn't trust that. You know, like, there's no good resource, and we have to figure this out. The other challenge that I've sort of already alluded to is that most variants for rare disease are unique or incredibly rare. In fact, the data from my lab, 67% of the variants we report out for rare disease testing, we see in one 
family only, and we've never seen them again. This makes it incredibly hard to interpret these variants in an effective way. And in fact, from a paper we wrote in, in published in the England Journal of Medicine last year, when we, we are now able to compare interpretations from laboratories through a big data sharing project we have going on, 17% of the time labs differed in their interpretation of these variants. So at least one got it wrong, maybe both, but at least one. And these are results going back to patients today. So we have a challenge in front of us. Um, and you know, when we pay, published that paper, it got a lot of media attention about the challenges in this field. Um, and in fact, March 14th, just a couple months ago, there was a lawsuit against one of the labs, Quest um, uh, Athena Lab, that uh, was sued for a misinterpretation of a variant that they claim led to their child's death. Uh, and that child died at age two, and they believed that if the variant had been interpreted based on the literature that they referenced, that that child would have been appropriately diagnosed, not given the drugs the child was given, that they believe led to the child's death. So this is a big deal right now, um, and this lawsuit is ongoing. Um, also, the lack of data sharing makes this problem even harder. It's hard enough to interpret these variants. But when you don't have the data, it makes it harder. And I shared a story that we had experienced in my own lab here at Partners Healthcare where we reported a variant in a prenatal test as likely pathogenic for a disorder called Noonan syndrome, multiple congenital um, anomalies. And um, that fetus was terminated. A year later, we discovered that there was a researcher who had data showing that this variant was very common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population and clearly very benign, no disease causation. We did not have access to that information. And so we reported the variant based on the literature we had access to in the public domain. And that led to a decision that wouldn't have had the potentially had the outcome it did. So this is a really serious thing that we're talking about in terms of how we use this information in clinical care today, and it's a challenge. And we need to do it better. And I would argue to improve our knowledge of DNA variation, create consistency in variant classification, will require a massive effort in data sharing. And that's part of what my work has been focused on for the last five years, is how can we as clinical labs and clinicians and researchers and the whole community really do a better job? And that includes the patients. Patients have the most control of their own data. And so, whereas often some of the institutions stand behind, oh, privacy issues, we can't share the data, we don't have permission from the patients. Well, if the patients say, yes, please share my data, then they can get around that. And we should have the patients be advocates for their own knowledge and learning. So I'm part of a project called the Clinical Genome Resource. This is an NIH-funded program that's trying to create an authoritative central resource that defines the clinical relevance of genes and variants for use both in medicine and research. So we focus on lots of data sharing efforts from all the stakeholders, the patients, the clinicians, the labs, the researchers. And then we have teams of people, in fact, over 400 people from over 90 institutions already part of this project, where we ask critical questions of that data. Is this gene associated with disease with enough strong scientific evidence? Is this variant causative or pathogenic? Is this information actionable for the individual who might get it? Will they do something with this information that will change their outcome? And then we put that into curated genomic knowledge bases that we share publicly with the community so that we can hopefully improve patient care. That's really our goal and what we are focused on and have been for a number a few years. So one of the databases we've been working on is called ClinVar. You can Google it and open up ClinVar, and if you have your favorite variant, you can put it in the search screen and look it up. Anybody can do this. Um, so if you had a genetic report that you had testing and got a variant on it, you go type it in here and look it up. Sometimes you might come across this overall interpretation, conflicting interpretations of pathogenicity. I alluded to that. Um, and, but you could scroll down to the bottom and see, oh, well, what were those interpretations? One that was uncertain, one that was pathogenic, one was likely pathogenic. Who said what about that? When did they say it? You can click on summary evidence, and sometimes they put all the evidence. So, you know, a lot of us that are in the clinical lab community find this incredibly useful to, to see what papers other groups came. It's sometimes hard to find 
the evidence out there. You're Googling and PubMed searching and trying to get this evidence that is not collected in any e easy to access way. So you're trying to find papers, read through this papers, pull out evidence. It's not challenging. There is some obvious reasons that we differ in how we do this. But at least it show, gives transparency to, and maybe I missed a paper, but when I went into this ClinVar, I saw that another lab found a different paper, and I can go get that. So this is helping our community. We're also building resources that are on our ClinGen website, more gene-level resources, actionability resources, et cetera, that, that you can search for a gene and, and get information on. Um, so I'm going to give you a case example of where we deal with all these questions kind of every day in my lab. So we support one of the studies called BabySeq, where we're enrolling newborns, sequencing their exomes, finding information that might impact. Half the babies are from the Brigham Well Baby Nursery, and half are from Boston Children's NICU, um, or the Brigham NICU. So this was BabySeq case number 2025. 20, a couple weeks ago, we encountered this case. It's a healthy newborn born in the Brigham Well Baby Nursery, no relevant family history disclosed. But we found a variant in a gene called VCL. This variant looked very impactful to the protein. And this gene had been published as causal for dilated cardiomyopathy. But the question was, was there sufficient evidence in the literature for this relationship such that I should go to a healthy newborn baby and say, I think you're at risk for dilated cardiomyopathy, a very strong cause for sudden cardiac death risk. So that's a big diagnosis to give to a newborn baby. So we, we got to be right about this, right? So these are the questions I ask. Is, is this gene really a valid DCM gene? And if I believe that, then looking at the variant, do I think this variant is actually disease-causing, this particular variant? And then should I return this to a newborn? What's the argument that I should or shouldn't? So we're going to go through some of these questions. So the first question I asked, is this a VC, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy gene? So we have a a validity matrix where we assess the evidence of gene disease relationships and we classify them into definitive, strong, moderate, limited, no evidence, disputed or refuted. Um, and so we go through systematically with a scoring matrix, scoring functional evidence, genetic evidence, patient evidence. And then once we classify it, the, the tiering then tells us how to return it. And we only give back strong and definitive relationships in predictive tests like BabySeq, where it's a healthy baby and we're giving them a diagnosis very much potentially going to be life altering for that child. We only do that when we're really sure. So the gene's got to hit this category. If it doesn't, it doesn't go back. Um, if it's moderate, we might include it in a diagnostic test where the patient already has disease and we're willing to be a little more tolerant of less evidence. But if it's limited or below, we don't include it unless you're doing a uh, query of the entire genome and exome, in which case you're going into the unknown at the start. So that's sort of how we think about using this kind of evidence approach in how we interpret genomes and exomes and decide what to return. And this very complicated slide gives a sense of all the types of evidence we review and put it into these scoring matrix to, decide it, to try to do this in a semi-quantitative approach so that we can feel confident in our decision making and what we will return. So we did that for this gene. There were zebrafish and mouse models that actually showed progression to the disease. There were published cases, although I can tell you with just this evidence, it only hit limited until we gathered from, from my, actually my own clinical lab. We had been testing patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. We actually had 10 families with loss of function variants and segregation data, and we were able to build enough very clear evidence classify that gene as strong evidence for dilated cardiomyopathy. So check number one, it's okay. So then go on to the next question. Is the variant pathogenic? So what are the resources that we use to try to figure this out? Well, I, I mentioned this database, ClinVar, um, that we've been working, and this database is maintained by NCBI at NIH. Uh, we've been working with them for the last five years. We work with lots of groups to share their data, whether it's researchers, clinical labs, expert groups, clinics, patients directly, other databases. We get it all in one place. To date, we've gathered over interpretations of over 127,000 rare disease variants to date. So, and that's as of May. Database continues to grow as we work in this space. Now, I told you that 17% of the time, we as clinical labs disagree with each other. 
So we're trying to tackle that problem. And in fact, we analyze all the data in ClinVar and, and look for the discrepancies, and we work to resolve them. So we had one project we've been doing with four of the largest labs that contribute to ClinVar, my lab at Partners, Ambry, GeneDx, University of Chicago. We've collectively contributed almost 50,000 variants, just these four labs alone, to ClinVar. And we shared interpretations on about 6,000 of those variants, where we could compare each other's interpretations. And 88% of the time, we agreed. 8% of the time, we disagreed. But those differences were uncertain versus benign, which probably don't impact a patient. It's when you get the likely pathogenic or pathogenic categories that would suggest we think it's disease causing. If it's that versus the, another lab saying, I don't think this has anything to do with these, those are the big differences. We are 4% um, different in those categories. So we've been working through these variants. We've done 232 of them so far. And we were able to resolve 86% of them by sharing data uh, and coming to consensus on those interpretations. So we can get better, but it relies upon data sharing and consensus work. So, so these are some of the resources that we're using to share our knowledge and come to more professional agreement on the interpretations of variants so that the patients benefit from that data sharing. I wish all the physicians I went to would talk with each other, and maybe they'd give me a more accurate suggestion to care for my, my ailments. <laughs> so getting back to this question, is this variant pathogenic? Well, it turns out this variant is actually novel. It's never been published before. But we have a certain number of rules when we get to these variants that predict the truncation of a variant, where it's pretty obvious to see it's disrupting the protein. So we looked at a number of different questions that we asked to make sure we feel comfortable predicting that. And we decided, yes, we do believe this deletion of a base would shift the reading frame, make that protein be chopped in half and quickly degraded, and therefore would be non-functional. And we think, therefore, based on the known mechanism of this gene in disease, that this variant would be pathogenic. So we check, check. But then we get to the last question, should I give this result back to a baby? So then you ask yourself, well, what are they going to do with this result? Are they going to take action? Can we improve the outcome of this baby's life by giving them this information? Or is it like giving them risk for Alzheimer's disease as a baby with, sorry, there's nothing we can do, but late in your life you're going to you know, get this unfortunate disorder? That we don't give back. But if there's something that you can do in childhood to change the outcome to beneficial, that if you knew about this information, you could change the outcome. If you don't know, you couldn't. So those are the questions we ask. We actually ask a number of parameters of what we call sort of actionability. Things like, what's the severe, you know, severity of the disease? And what's the severity of this disease? The potential severity is sudden cardiac death. That's pretty severe. And what's the likelihood you're actually going to get that? So if it's a low effect risk allele, you know, the risk is one out of 100 are going to get it. That's a very different question than 99 out of 100, right? So, so what exactly is the risk, the likelihood? And efficacy. So if there's a treatment, how good is the treatment? If it's just like I'm going to give a pill, but most of the time it doesn't work, well, that's not very efficacious. Um, and what's the nature of the intervention? Is this, uh, you just need to do some screening each year. We'll, we'll give you an x-ray each year. Or no, we got to chop out your liver. Like you know, those are very different interventions, right? Um, so nature of the intervention is another question. So we have actionability scoring across these severity, likelihood, effectiveness, nature of the intervention, add up the scores, and then we have actionability score ranges from zero, not very actionable, to twelve, very actionable. So dilated cardiomyopathy, um, although these aren't the specific genes, they're very similar how we'd score this for different genes scored in the 10 to, you know, for different interventions, placement of an uh, cardiac defibrillator, pharmacotherapy, ACE inhibitors, very high scores for intervening in dilated cardiomyopathy. So there is things that you can do to prevent sudden cardiac death in these patients. So check, yes. And, and I should note, from the data that we have from the families, we estimate about 65% penetrance. Um, so the likelihood that this baby will develop disease is reasonably high. Now, I will argue that the data that we have from families with disease is undoubtedly biased in its ascertainment. And the actual risk is probably lower. 
And we certainly know that from you know, breast cancer. The original estimates of the risk of developing breast cancer uh, from family studies was very high, well over 80%. Now looking at an you know, unbiased, ascertained, broad population, those risks are probably a little lower. But nonetheless, we're not talking way, way low. We're still talking you know, fairly significant. So we, as a group of uh, clinicians and scientists involved in Baby Seed Project, made the decision to give this result back to this baby. Uh, and we did that just like a week ago, and the baby is now being referred to cardiology for a workup. So this is what we deal with you know, in these sorts of studies, the kinds of information that we can find and give back to individuals. So that was one case study. Now I'm going to go through a, a series of other cases. Um, probably plenty of time. So uh, question, go ahead. Yep. So, so if I can repeat the question so everybody can hear it, is your question, are we examining these babies to see if they have any evidence of disease already or might be at risk from their clinical features, those sorts of things? Is that the essence of your question that might then guide what we look at in these genomes? Right, so, so there are a couple things. Um, for most of the babies in the well baby nursery, there's no clinical indication. They don't have disease, um, and so we're not looking for anything specific. Now, if they develop an indication, maybe they don't pass their hearing screen, and the physician says, oh, the baby just failed their hearing screen. We're concerned about a genetic form of hearing loss. Half kids who have congenital hearing loss have a genetic cause. That's uh, one in, in a thousand kids have genetic hearing loss. So if we had a specific indication relayed to us, and, and obviously these kids are being followed by the um, OB and then the pediatrician, et cetera, they would relay that to us and we would look specifically for those kinds of indications. In the NICU, there often are specific indications. They're in the NICU because they're sick. And so they relay to us what the reason they're in the NICU for, what they're clinical features are, and we then look specifically at certain genes that are associated to those clinical features. So we're kind of doing both things. We're, we're trying to use, the part of the study is, if a physician had access to genomic information, how might that help the care of that patient? And that could either be help them answer specific questions that they have because the child has some sort of issue, or it's, I had no indication but what did you find, and might that be of use to me to prevent some serious outcome later, right? Kids die every day as babies, SIDS, and other things, and you know, could we prevent some of those things from happening? So, so that's, that's the nature of the study is, what might a genome do for you when you got a baby, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so hopefully that gave you a sense of the study. So, um, Another study that we're doing, actually, that's just sort of ending, it was the sort of prequel to BabySeq, was MedSeq. Uh, this was a little less stressful because these were adults instead of newborns. Um, but same sort of premise uh, as BabySeq, we actually enrolled 100 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy along with their cardiologists and 100 patients uh, who were healthy along with their primary care physicians. They then got randomized to either getting whole genome sequencing or standard of care that just involved taking a family history. Um, we then, my lab, you know, interpreted the genomes, wrote those genome reports, returned that to the patients, and then we recorded the physicians returning the results and explaining and answering questions. And the premise here was partly, there's a number of things we were looking at, but one of them is, can a non-genetic specialist actually deal with genomic information and return it, because we don't have enough medical geneticists for every patient on the face of the earth to have a medical geneticist involved in their care. So can a primary care physician do this? Can a cardiologist do this? So we, we created a, a simplified report of everything that we might find in a genome, monogenic disease risk, carrier status, pharmacogenomic associations, blood cell and platelet antigen predictions, 
all on one page in a simplified form. The physicians could then go to subsequent pages and get more detail. What is this disease, and why, is, why do you think the variant's disease causing, and what's the familial risk, and all that information. But it gave them some sense of what was found. And overall, for Mendelian disease risk, about 21% of these patients had some sort of risk. Uh, almost all of them had carrier status for some recessive disorder. For the half of them that had cardiomyopathy, we found the cause of their disease in about half of them. So this is generally sort of the findings that we saw. Um, so I'm going to actually explain one of the cases, because part of our interest, as I mentioned, was can a primary care physician consume this information and actually return it to a patient? So what sort of training do these physicians get? Well, they get six hours of genetic genomic training at the start of study, two hours of its didactic teaching, and four hours of case modules that they sort of work their way through. They get CME credit for this. Um, and then that's all they get, six hours at the beginning of the study. And then we return these results and reports to them. We just send them. I don't talk to them on the phone. They get them sent to them. Um, and then the physicians, if they have questions, can contact our genetic resource center at any point. Email, phone, text. Then we record those disclosures, and, and, and then we transcribe them, and then we read through them or listen to them and see if they did it right. So I'm going to show two cases um, that I think one did it right, one not quite right enough. <laughs> so, um, so in this case, this was what we'd call an incidental negative finding. So the PCP asked the patient, what did you think you were going to learn through the sequencing? And the patient says, well, one thing may be interesting, actually, my mother and my grandmother both had breast cancer, and my sister had breast cancer and a bilateral mastectomy about a year ago, and so I thought that might be interesting from my daughter's point of view, is she at risk? Yikes! <laughs> and it turns out the sister actually had had a genetic test and had a breast cancer mutation, subsequently relayed. And so, so his answer was, I didn't have anything monogenic, which is the main thing I thought I'd look for. So I'm, I'm in the clear, and so is my daughter. You know. Ooh, so the physician said, no, 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 don't assume that BRCA1 and 2 were checked here. Don't assume it. I would not make any assumptions whatsoever that covered that. And the study team is like, yay, yay, they figured it out. So the point is that when you get your genome sequenced or your exome sequenced, it's not that word whole genome and whole exome is a little misleading. We don't cover it all. There's places we miss. Um, and that's just the nature of the technology. And even if we cover everything and we have full sequence data of every gene, which is not there today, there's three to five million variants in that gene. I told you at the beginning, we don't interpret all of that. Our pipelines pull out the stuff that has already been reported as disease causing from databases that aren't always complete. I showed you these databases. Not everybody's sharing yet. And things that are obviously look disruptive. But there's lots of variants in there that are the VUS type that we don't, can't interpret today. And so there could be variants in that gene that we just didn't look at, never reported, because that guy didn't tell us that his sister had breast cancer. So, so this is a challenge, and this, you know, and, but the good thing is that from six hours of training as a primary care physician, he got it, and he appropriately relayed to the patient, no, don't assume that. This information was relayed back to us, and then we went in looking specifically at that breast cancer gene, make sure it was fully sequenced, and make sure there were no variants in there. That then was something we could do more accurately. Okay, so, so that physician got it. it the pa patient was appropriately directed for their appropriate care. Case number two, when to step in. So this was a case where he didn't have any monogenic disease risk. They had carrier status. And one of those carrier status genes was cystic fibrosis disease, you might have heard. It's one of the more common recessive um, genetic disorders. And they had not the common variant, the Delta 508, but they had a rare CF variant. So the physician is, um, and then the details of this variant are described in the report. So the physician says, so based on this, this means you are in fact a carrier, and it's possible your children could be carriers as well. But knowing this particular variant and that you have a growing family, it's worthwhile bringing this to the attention of your children and for them to bring it to attention their obstetricians. Going well. Got it. Um, patient says, OK. P patient physician says, so when they order the test, they can actually screen for that. Now, if they don't have the gene, and then the patient says, I should be probably taking notes then. <laughs> yes. Well, this one right here, this is the one you want them to check for, this variant. Uh, so far, so good. 
But then the patient says, my daughter. So if she had this allele, then the next thing to do would be to test my son-in-law, her partner. So yes, correct. And he would have to have the exactly, precisely the same allele, which is, well, there are many alleles to pertain to cystic fibrosis, you're saying. I don't recall, but there's about 32 or so. There's many of them. That's a lot. Well, he would have to have this particular one right. So we're getting down to some pretty remote possibilities. Yeah, small odds. But it's still, I understand. OK, thank you. So did he get it right? How many say yes? How many say no? So what, what, what was wrong here? It doesn't have to have the same mutation, not the least of which is there's a lot more than 32 of them out there. There's like thousands of CF mutations. And you can disrupt the gene with any of them, and you combine that together. So we didn't quite get that piece right. So what did we do? Well, we wrote a very nice letter saying, gee, you're doing a great job. But by the way, <laughs> individuals do not have to have the exact same two pathogenic variants. And we went on to do the calculation and say that this individual's risk of having a child with CF was 1 in 200. Now, some families would say that's pretty low risk. Other families would say that's pretty high risk. It's all dependent on your perspective. The key thing is accurately relaying that information to the family so that they can make their decision about what to do with that information. So we sent a very nice sort of letter and follow-up just to correct that piece of information. Um, OK, so how much time do we have left? Is that progress still ongoing? MedSeq? Yes. Um, we've finished enrolling the original set of 200 patients, but now we're uh, continuing on focusing on minority populations. Um, and we're you know, doing a slight extension of that. But yes, it is still ongoing, and now we're writing a grant for MedSeq number two. <laughs> um, OK, so I told you earlier, the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in individuals under 35 years is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These are all the people, not all the people, these are some of the people who have died of this disorder, some you may recognize. Um, so this is a case I can actually share publicly because it was in the newspapers. My lab um, was <laughs> involved in a story about Eddie Curry, who was a basketball player for the Chicago Bulls. And he had an, a heartbeat irregularity detected. And the team required genetic testing as a condition to play. Is this ethical? How many think it was appropriate for the team to do this and require him to have this test? OK, we have 25, maybe. How many think it's unethical for them to request this? about equal. So um, a lot of money. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a lot of risk on their part. there's a lot of risk. Um, so maybe the team has a right to require this. Those of you who don't think it's right, share with me why. Discrimination based on genetic information up there. So that's a good question. You know, if he gets this test, and we find a mutation, and then they throw him off the team. But maybe that mutation isn't very predictive of whether he's actually going to develop disease. So how much do we know about these genes? And how well can we use that information? Is that inappropriate to think we know that much? That's a good point up there. So are they hiring a person or a genetic? Yeah. Um, so great question. Now, interestingly, um, the team less publicized fact, said that they were willing to pay him $400,000 a year for life if he tested positive and was thrown off the team. I'm like, I wish I had that deal in my job. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, maybe I should go get tested. Uh, so there was a slight clause there that kind of gave him you know, an out. So does anybody know what happened with this case? He refused to take the test. And he was traded to the Knicks. See ya. <laughs> so at least he's got options. So that was the outcome of this case. Let me tell you about another case. Um, Wait a minute, is oh. he alive or dead? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Is he alive or dead? To my knowledge, he is still alive and kicking. Um, although I can't guarantee that. <laughs> um, so another topic that's come up in, uh, in our um, sort of uh, population, I guess, is should athletes be screened by EKGs? It's actually done in other countries, particularly Italy. Every athlete gets screening by EKG to look for risk for sudden cardiac death. And this is data from um, a study showing that the risk of sudden cardiac death going down in athletes that are screened 
um, after implementing two decades of screening. Um, so that brings me, so there's been a lot of people who have argued that athletes should be screened. They're at heightened risk because of the un, a lot of stress on their hearts, higher than the average uh, individual in the population. And some have proposed, well, maybe just Olympics or professional or college or even down to high school athletics. So here's a story that was an actual case in my lab. A college basketball player faints on the court. So there's a lot of reasons you can faint on the court, but one of them is a heart condition that leads to what we call syncope or fainting. And so he faints on the court. You can also faint because you're dehydrated and lots of other reasons, but cardiac evaluation reveals high blood pressure and mild hypertrophy. What's that? So that means your heart is slightly thickened. Now, it should be pointed out that athletes, due to a lot of cardiovascular need, often have slightly hypertrophied hearts, right? Just because their heart needs that extra push, right? And the muscle actually hypertrophies a little bit to respond to the very strong blood pressure that's needed. So he could have mild hypertrophy because he's a professional athlete or because he's at early stages of cardiomyopathy. We don't know. Of course, a little concerning that he faints on the basketball floor. So the university requests genetic testing for HCM of him, and his family doesn't refuse, he doesn't refuse, and we identify what we at that time called a likely pathogenic variant. The player was ejected from the team and his scholarship was also lost. He was an individual that only could afford to go to college because of the full scholarship he had to the school. Uh, five years later, that variant got reclassified as likely benign. So that, to me, was devastating outcome of this young athlete. So it, it's a really important question as we think about accurate interpretation and information and evidence around genetics and the impact that it can have on our lives. Um, and there's, you know, here is a dilemma. So additional studies around screening. This is the estimate. A national program of EKG screening for US athletes would save almost 5,000 lives over 20 years, but would cost more than $50 billion, yielding a cost per life in the range of 10 to $14 million. Yikes, how do you make that decision? And then you have to feed all those. <laughs> feed, feed them all, yes. Uh, <laughs> the extra 5,000 that didn't die. <laughs> okay, yeah, good point. <laughs> um, so this is not an easy question to answer, is it? Right? Should we screen them or not? Um, so that's, um, that's a, so are we getting, should we pack it up here? Oh, we can wrap it up. Okay. So um, I'll do one more case. Um, so and this, this is just a, a long, part of my life. Nine-year-old boy collapses on the soccer field. Cardiac workup shows left ventricular hypertrophy, this sort of same thickened heart, um, and he's diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Prior to that event, the parents had raised concern with the pediatrician numerous times, um, and the pediatrician said, don't worry, growing pains, you know, you know, he's just tired from playing sports, and they kept complaining that he was exhausted after sports, et cetera and was never diagnosed appropriately until he collapsed on the soccer field. Past history of the child was a result of sperm donation. Um, and it turns out, when they contacted the reproductive clinic um, to obtain information on the donor's health records. So this donor had 22 children, um, <laughs> and one of those um, ch children, the sperm donor, died at age two of cardiac failure that they claimed was due to mitochondrial disease which would have then meant it came from the mom, not the dad. Um, but with a child who fainted on the soccer field and diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and another who had died at age two, concern was raised. Um, so the clinic contacted the donor and offered him free clinical evaluation for cardiac disease. The donor had no outward symptoms of disease. He was in his, I think, 30s at that point. No fainting, no shortness of breath, no chest pain. But when evaluated, the echocardiography showed mildly enlarged heart. So they ordered genetic testing on this donor, and uh, we found a mutation. Families were all sent letters, there were lots of families involved here, about the diagnosis of this disease. 
um, and evidence of disease in the donor, but that the donor had no symptoms. And it was actually a little misleading to the families that they were like, but the donor had no symptoms. They're like, yeah, but the kid died at age two, another one just passed on the field, and not mine. So it was like a lot of stress and anxiety around this. Um, and the families were alerted to the availability of the target mutation test that we were offering after having diagnosed the donor with uh, a mutation for HCM that explained his disease. Um, we also tested the kid who died or passed out on the soccer field. He was positive. Um, so in all, 18 children were tested. Two were donor, the donor's actual children living with him. Um, that were also tested, one of whom was positive as well. So there's six children who remain. So this is the pedigree. <laughs> Sometimes I show the pedigree first and say, well, what do you think this is? And people are like, mouse pedigree? You know, like, no, this is a real family. Um, so you know, there's a, a whole lot of children, um, 11 who have tested positive for this mutation. Um, so we gave all this information back to the family, uh, all sorts of things. Um, so what's the story here? So the, the interesting side of this is sperm donors, I learned all sorts of stuff in this study, sorry. So they, weekly donation over an 18 month period, they collect a lot of sperm from these people. Um, and you know, the most common cause of sudden death is, as I mentioned, uh, it's one in 500 adults with just this one disorder, but there's a lot of others, dilated cardiomyopathy, channelopathies, all sorts of things that um, cause sudden cardiac death. Um, and so an EKG will actually pick up many of these conditions that are related to sudden cardiac death. So the question that we were thought about is so many kids are being born to one individual's germline that should those sperm donors actually be screened by EKG to avoid this sort of situation? Because that donor would have been picked up in EKG. Uh, so we actually wrote a paper implications of HCM transmitted by sperm do donation, and we recommended that all sperm donors be screened by EKG as part of the standard workup. Now that got picked up by the media. Um, the Today Show asked for an interview. I was like, I was young in my career. I was like, the Today Show. Uh, um, and then asked a family to join the show. Um, and the families were actually very strong advocates of this, because you heard that one story about the kid that was misdiagnosed, but there's several other kids it's actually quite common that ki kids are not diagnosed appropriately despite having active symptoms um, and they're just shot up to, oh, maybe asthma, maybe you know, growing pains, and these kids die without you know, getting diagnosed. So these families wanted this on the media. They wanted it out there because they needed families to know about this disease. So they were all pro, but then uh, one family objected because they had not really explained to their child what this disease was about, and they were fearful that she was going to hear this on the news and get all panicky. So she sent a letter that said that she would sue me if I went on the Today Show. <laughs> so then I had to get the IRB involved, media people at Partners Healthcare, and like, it was a disaster. <laughs> and they were finally like, you did nothing wrong. I actually got consent from every single family to publish that story. Um, and you know, there was nothing they said I did wrong. However, the head of media at Partners Healthcare said, you can make the decision yourself, but keep in mind that unhappy patients make for pretty bad press. <laughs> it's like, damn it. So, so, you know, should I go on the news or not? How many think I should have gone on the news? How many think I shouldn't have gone on the news? So I didn't go on the news. Now, part of it started getting a little sketchy. They were going to have the donor behind a screen, only hearing his voice. I was like, OK, maybe the Today Show isn't my highlight in media. I'd rather go on Jon Stewart or something like that. So, so I, I eventually said no. <laughs> and you know, the rest is history. But, but anyway, I hope that was informative to some of the, the challenges, the stories, and the things we deal with in genomics. So thank you very much.